I'd like to say hello to William Freyer and Max, if you're listening at home. <laughs> I wonder if they do. Anyway, um, those who've been at the um, presentation probably have seen uh, a little bit about water allocation planning and things. I thought just for a little bit of a difference, I'd align the importance of, of what it is in terms of uh, the Premier's economic priorities, which have been uh, discussed or emerged recently. And really, um, water allocation plans are there. Bottom line says it all really maintain water security and, and, and maximise sustainable uh, development. Uh, that's the region that I'll be talking about today, but familiar to you all, the western and the eastern Mount Lofty Ranges. There's a, a separate water management plan, water allocation plan for each. Um, the two sites from which the data um, I use today are from those particular ones. Um, basically from a wet side and a dry side. The rainfall is almost about two, twice the um, level of the rainfall at the site in the east. Um, so with, there are significant challenges to implementing um, water allocation plans, as, as everybody is aware. Um, the, there are lots of, there are, there are specific objectives articulated in the plan, but also of course we have a region that is, is quite limited in its water availability. Um, that's not the most recent version of my slides, I notice. Which is a bit of a problem. I do have another one, yeah. I knew I should have checked. <laughs> well, I guess we'll just have to wing it anyway. It doesn't matter. I don't want to talk specifically about MERI, which is the Monitoring and Evaluation Framework, but um, we'll get going anyway. Yeah, I will. Uh, anyway, so uh, the two primary challenges there from a hydrological perspective are um, the change of scale at which water allocation planning is implemented. We're all going to, to smaller scales. Um, and also the fact that the, the climatic data isn't as reliable as, as we thought it once was. Um, so basically, with regard to, if I discuss these couple of things um, separately, um, we're going to these subcatchment scale rules and management um, interventions, surface water management scale. We identify areas of high demand or development. And probably most significantly is we're trying to allocate the flow regime rather than uh, static annual volume. And that's what we call the securing low flows initiative, whereby low flows are passed down to downstream users, including the environment, and the larger flows are, are trapped for development. I'm not going to go there. The way that that's managed is in the terms of the flow duration curve here. Um, the, we, we say that the modelling has shown us that environmental outcomes can be achieved if we pass all of this stuff to the right. This is a log scale of flow up to the side, and this is a probability scale here. So the, the volume of the flows is much greater than it is down here. But the point is that um, this study has identified different processes for different parts of the flow duration curve. Um, basically, the amount that we're passing is um, in the realm of subsurface processes, which we haven't actually done before. Um, so coming to the second point, um, non-stationary climate, um, there's been some changing rainfall. The, the periods there, the dark, the light coloured area there to the left is, is basically the beginning of observed record for this site, Bremer River. We've got a little bit of earlier data to 1970 with the other one at Scott Creek, which um, basically coincides with the period over which the WAP was uh, made. This point here, 20, 2006, is the end of the WAP period, and so the comparisons are made between these two. Um, rainfall's a little bit lower, but not significantly. And stream flow and base flow, total flow here, base flow is the part that comes out of the ground, more or less. And uh, that's changed as well, gotten a little bit lower in recent times since the WAP, but not significantly so. Going across to Scott Creek, um, rainfall is still not significantly different to the WAP period. However, um, total flow and base flow is significant in uh, three out of the four performance criteria that I used in that assessment. So 
there's a bit of a change happening there. And that's a, one of the consequences of not having the right thing. The point is that sub, subsurface um, processes seem to be changing in some places. Um, comparing it to total cumulative rainfall, this is the a classic um, double mass plot, um, total flow on the left, base flow on the right, at Bremer on the eastern side of the hills, um, red dots are dry years, purple circles are high evapotranspiration years, and the red is a catchment parameter that I'll talk about later. Um, basically, Bremer River, if we've um, oh, this has got the wrong dots on it too, damn it. Oh, well, anyway, uh, my most recent slide had an extra year, which is last year, which is a shame because it shows something interesting, but here we go. Anyway, the, um, the pattern of variability between total stream flow and base flow does show um, a little bit of a um, falling over or a, a gentling of the, the slope, which indicates um, lower levels of runoff or the same amount of precipitation. And the patterns in which that can occur, I might as well go to Scott Creek actually, patterns in which that can occur um, basically occur after these significant red dots. That's the 70s. Um, hardly pretty similar really, but base flow and stream flow quite different in Scott Creek. You can see how after the intense couple of years that stream flow um, basically started to come back in the years immediately after it. In base flow, the response was suppressed for a longer period of time. And the same is true with the end of the millennium drought up there, a couple of dry years in a row. Um, some average years returned the flow and it started to kick the gradient back up, but base flows remained suppressed. 2015 is another red dot. The only two other places where there's more than one red dot is that place there, and you can see that there's this marked um, repression of base flow. So uh, we've got a situation where base flow and stream flow are significantly changed. We've got a time now where there's um, risks of things looking quite unpleasant. So that uh, short-term climatic events can <coughs> produce this more persistent change. Um, and I just make the comment that with the, the trend of those changes really gives you the impression of a changing climate, a gradually changing, drying catchment, as though the amount of water and the connectivity between the, uh, the streams and the near surface groundwater is becoming more distant, as though you pull the plug out of the bottom of the catchment and everything's just sort of shifting down a little bit. Uh, the point too there that I would make is that the, the shift is a little bit more pronounced in wetter areas where there is more water to lose in the first place than in the second. I'm not going to do that one either. And I'm not going to do that one either. I want to get on to the assessment evaluation. So basically we need something that looks at climate, um, heat and some of the catchment processes. Where can we find such a thing? Does such a thing exist? Well it does. A bloke did one in um, the 1950s, his name was Budiko. And for those who know, it is quite famous actually, that's the equation there. And he had set, postulated two boundary conditions. That is, that the ratio between potential evapotranspiration and rainfall and actual evapotranspiration and rainfall uh, were limited by two lines. This one is where actual evapotranspiration is equal to rainfall. That is, every amount of a uh, bit of rain you get goes off into the atmosphere. That's a classic of dry places like Australia. So that side of the one is basically called water limited, such as we see around here. And where evapotranspiration equals potential evapotranspiration on this diagonal line, and this bit in here is called radiation limited, thereby you've got so much water, um, it's only the amount of sun, the, the water exceeds the amount that's able to be um, evaporated, and that's like your humid tropics and things like that. The end thing, which was the red um, year in the previous double mass curves is the thing that basically integrates everything and so while Boudicca's relationship was on mean annual stuff this particular framework is looking at how that end changes from year to year through condition after condition how runoff changes well I'm not going to no I'm going to talk because <laughs> it's not fair 
Uh, this is what it looks like in, uh, in, in Bremer River. Uh, that's the blue curve. Don't worry about the green and the yellow. I took them off ages ago, but there you are. Um, that's the observed data. That cross is the mean of the data, and that curve is the theoretical curve. So there's good accord between the two. So the other things are, are Zane curves, which for different reasons don't have any accord with real data. But anyway, that's what they are. I don't want to talk about that. Um, I'm going to go straight to here. Now this graphic takes the horizontal axes of um, the preceding Boudicca curve and I just plot it with losses, simple losses, rather than have that ratio of um, precipitation underneath it. And when you do that, you can plot it against raw rainfall, you can plot it against uh, losses if you like. I'll just talk about losses here because I've um, fitted a, the, the Boudicca curve. That's the median. Uh, these are 20, the grey lines are 25th percentiles on either side. The dark blue dots are post watt periods, the light blue dots are the reference period or the watt period. You can see that there, for a given um, amount of uh, aridity, if you like, there's more loss. The, the catchments are losing more. You can see it the other way. Um, and that's true of all of the uh, catch uh, all of the years in Scott Creek catchment in Bremer, it's not so pronounced. Uh, there's a little bit of mixing around there. You see down here that's 1982 and 2006. They're probably the two worst records. Now, the big problem here is see, I've got these emotive things secure, vulnerable, impacted, which are useful for water management or if you want to scare the community. Um, 2015 is in there somewhere, and it didn't come out in that one, but nonetheless. So if you could imagine that 2015 is there and it's there, there are two consecutive years in this, what I've called in this particular one, impacted state, and it's not far from two unambiguously horrid years. So Scott Creek, we've got significant change. Um, we've got two consecutive years implying a risk. Bremer River, we've got not significant change, but the data is very similar. 2015 and 2014 are there. So there's a couple of interesting things. I'm not going to talk about flow duration curves as part of this whole thing, but um, I think really the take-home message is that, yes, um, th there's lots of reasonable data. There's some transparent tools that we can use that conveys a message. We've got um, remarkable insight in what we can expect is going to happen in at least part of the water resource picture next year already by looking at them. Um, change is one thing to talk about. Some places have not experienced change, but they're existing at the same level of risk. Where there's less water to have been lost already, um, there is less change. It's not a measure of the risk. Scott Creek has fat on the bone. That's being cut from a surface water groundwater interaction perspective. And that's about it. Thank you. Take a few questions, Flash. Yeah. Well, the, the WAP is due for revision. Um, it represents the best available information to date. And this is exactly the sort of purpose which will provide the boards with information to make that decision. Yeah. Yeah. The decision to charge sand, uh, license holders for a standard fee for their allocation, rather than what is actual water usage, what impact is I couldn't speculate on the price of water, madam. I'm sorry, really couldn't. Do you have any other questions? Thank you.